<clears throat> Clear my throat to get started. <laughs> there you go. Hey, everybody. Hopefully we're uh, coming in clear, nice and clear as we get kind of wrapped up here. Hopefully no technical glitches like we had last time around. So we'll see about that. But uh, before I forget, just want to make sure you guys all know that we're obviously live here today, but we will be turning this into the Desert Farmer podcast. You can find that on our website. I think we're a little delayed as far as uploading that. So we don't quite have April up yet, but um, these will be available for you guys there. Um, obviously free to download, um, but it'll be a condensed version of what we're doing here on YouTube today. So we have topic of discussion today. What would that be? What we're harvesting in May. Yes. So we've already been harvesting because it's the, what you got? A little like nap. Oh, okay. So we've already been harvesting for the last week because we're in May now. We just wrapped something up today, actually, right? Yep. We have wrapped up loquats today. Loquats. So we had our gold nugget low. So the way that worked, we harvested loquats for almost a solid month. Yeah. Actually, it was right on about a month. Yeah. So we had the three out of four of our loquat trees were fruiting and ripening in the month of May or in the month of April. April. Mm -hmm. So we had a champagne loquat that we harvested at the end of March. Little we we pushed it to the end of March. <laughs> we pushed it. Really, the beginning of April. We, we really, really, really <laughs> wanted something ripe in March. So. We harvested the first champagne loquat in March. Most of those were the beginning of April. Then we had the Macbeth loquats, which were very good. Mm -hmm. I think those may be my favorite. Really? So far. Yeah, they were really good. The Yehuda on the old property was really good too. I, yeah, I, I still like the Yehuda. We might have to... We have to snag one of those. Yeah, I don't know where we'll put it, but... I'm not sure either. Might but have to get one. <laughs> maybe. So we finished up with the Gold Nugget loquat, which was quite a bit smaller mm -hmm. and more round as opposed to oval, mm -hmm. but we harvested the last ones today, and actually those were a little overripe. Yeah, we left those on there a little too long. <clears throat> yeah, I think we probably should wrap that up. Probably, probably last weekend. Last weekend, so yeah. probably end of April. Yeah. So basically for the entire month of April, it was loquats and then into berries, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. And then we are still harvesting mulberries. So the Shangri-Las are winding down, uh, those were almost done. The black Pakistans, we only got a couple of ripe ones off of those trees. And they're still young. They're only a year, year and a half in the ground. Yeah. So not much there. Um, obviously, the fruit was nice and big. Mm -hmm. But the ever-growing mulberries continue to produce heavy. So we are harvesting those again this morning. Now, yeah. how, many, how many pounds would you estimate of mainly ever-bearing mulberries do you think we have at this point? You know, I lost count at 20 one gallon Ziploc bags. So I'd have to go back through the freezer and recount because I know I got to 20, but I can't remember. But did you count today? Because you added some I today. added three more today. So we're probably 25. 25. And maybe so, 30. So between 25 <laughs> and 30 bags. And for reference, each one of those bags holds about three and a half to four pounds mm -hmm. of mulberries. Mm -hmm. So we're well over 75 pounds, 80 oh, pounds. Yeah. Pounds. Yeah, and that's mostly off of the three ever-bearing. There's some Shangri-Las in there, but not that many. I would say, I don't even know if we'd have a full bag of just Shangri-Las. So we'll wrap up mulberry picking in May. So yeah. that'll definitely be something that we're harvesting in May because it's May now and we were harvesting. Yeah. Right? Um, so, and I think we have okay, some questions. Okay, so we have, we have Kelly here. We hey, Kelly. We have uh, Coyote's Den. Mm. Uh, construction Happens. has started on their house finally. That's awesome, Chris. Man, it's about time. I'm sure you're feel, you're feeling the same way. <laughs> we have Daniel. Love you guys. Hey, Daniel. We have, hey, from is that Vail, Arizona, in Ooh, the house? Nice. We have Alan here. Hi, gang. Hey, how's it going, Alan? Revolutionary hippies. What part of Arizona are you guys located? So we are in Whitman, Arizona. So it is about an hour directly northwest of downtown Phoenix. So I work in downtown Phoenix. It takes me about an hour to get into town to get to work. Uh, and it's on Grand. So yeah, on Grand, there. and then we are about 30 minutes further would be Wickenburg. So. Right, so between Surprise and Wickenburg, yeah. basically. Yep. And then we have Lisa, hi from Valley Farms, Arizona, near Florence. Right. Ooh, very nice, very nice. We have Dar Daryl, hello, hey, Daryl. Dwayne and Lori. Just started boiling a pot of crawfish. 
I'm out. I'm coming over. <laughs> Kelly, how often are you watering to support that mulberry fruiting? Uh, so the mulberries are on the same watering schedule as the rest of our fruit trees, our primary fruit trees. So those are being watered once a week and we're putting about 60 gallons once a week. In fact, it just watered today. So mm -hmm. we water that once a week, 60 gallons. Each one of those trees is getting that. And that is also where we originally started all of our trees. We had all of our potted trees there. So I know there's a tremendous amount of worm activity and they're super happy. Yeah. And then obviously we'll increase watering as soon as it starts getting over a hundred. Consistently. Hopefully over. they'll be done fruiting at that time. Yeah. So we'll, we'll stay with that same watering schedule probably for the next couple of weeks. I'm guessing, I think we officially hit a hundred degrees this coming week. And you guys in the city, you guys have already seen a couple of hundred degree days. We haven't been there quite yet. But once we're consistently over 100 during the day and consistently over 70 at night and super dry, then we will bump that up just a little bit, probably push 80 to 90 gallons, uh, probably once a week. We're going to try to stick with the once a week schedule this year, if we can. We have Brandon. Hello, everyone. Hey, Brandon. Funny Farm Low Family, Arizona. So excited. We just planted mulberry trees. Woo -hoo. We have Can't Alan. Go wrong with those. Oh, Daryl, my dinner invite seems to have gotten lost. Yeah, we're, I, I need to find mine too. I'm sure it came in the mail somewhere. <laughs> I love crawfish. Oh my goodness. All right, we have Kelly, wave. And then Alan, gotten, oh, gotten lost. Um, we have Jose. Hello, Jose from El Paso. Hey, El Paso. I used to travel to El Paso. Uh, we have Alicia Queen Creek in the house. Hey, what's up, Queen Creek? Um, we have Slam Boy. Our, oh, it says, are you going nuts? And then he put growing nuts. <laughs> <laughs> I saw that. I'm like, we are nuts. So, we kind yeah. of are going nuts, I think. <laughs> There's something to that. Not going nuts. We are nuts. Yeah, we are We're crazy. a little crazy. We're a little crazy. There's no doubt about that. Growing nuts. Uh, yes. So we have, we have, okay, so technically we have two different types of nuts. And then we have a few different varieties. So we are growing pecans and we are growing almonds. Those are really the two primary nut crops that you're able to get away with here in the Phoenix, Arizona area. The almonds do really well and mm -hmm. pecans, once they're established, actually do really well also. Yeah, thank you. So we've got uh, three different, two different types of almonds and we have four different types of uh, pecan trees that are planted, only two of which so far have taken off. So we'll see how that goes. All right, did you guys add anything to get the earth's worms? I have a large four foot tall block garden mm -hmm. with great soil amend every year, but never seen a worm ever. Thanks. Right, so we these worms were transplanted, for the most part, transplanted from the old farm. We got worm activity on the old farm. I don't know where it came from. So I'm assuming it, they traveled in pots of some type of potted tree that we planted at some point in time. And then we basically propagated them. So we encouraged their growth in the potted fruit trees that we brought onto the farm from the old property. And I want to say we had 15 to 20 trees we uh, brought from the old property. When we first got onto this one, we set up the chicken tractors to keep them safe from the cows, the free range cattle. And we set them on top of wood chips all winter for the first winter we were here. Once we pulled those trees off, that those wood chip piles were completely loaded with worms. And then we had some compost there that also wound up with worms in it. And we transplanted the compost onto the other side of the farm. And then we've kind of just been bringing them with us in the uh, pig manure compost. They love pig manure. So every time we, we fertilize, we use that and we continue to transplant the worms throughout the farm. So I don't know where they came from directly, um, but an option that you can do, uh, the Arizona worm farm is definitely an option um, or easier still, a bait shop, like Wal uh, if assuming Walmart still has worms, um, buy a couple worms, toss them in your garden bed. Um, the key is giving them something to eat. So some type of compost, um, so your vegetable scraps, things like that, they will eat um, anything that's basically starting to decompose. Uh, they also eat um, things like wet cardboard and newspaper, all that kind of stuff they will munch on. But they, sh they sure do love their pig manure. Yeah. <laughs> pig poop is one of their favorite delicacies, apparently. All right, so we have third M Homes. Hello, what's the elevation they're planning to planning a build in New Mexico at about seven thousand feet? Okay, quite a bit different from where you're going to be at seven thousand. We're at about sixteen hundred feet here elevation, so quite a bit lower. 
and we are in zone 9B. Although we've hit 20 degrees, which is kind of 9A territory, um, being out away from the city, we're a little cooler, but you'll be a whole lot cooler, especially in New Mexico. So, but I imagine it's beautiful. Uh, Daniel just had my first Miwa kumquat the other day, Ooh, and I yes. purchased that tree on the spot. That and a Marumi kumquat as well. I was thinking of growing them together in the same hole. Any advice there? So we generally don't plant trees in the same hole, but I can tell you this. Kumquats, because they're a dwarfing uh, fruit tree, they can be plant planted very close together. I believe all of our kumquats are on about three foot centers. They share a half gallon bubble bubbler. So it's it's um, where we would typically plant a single tree. We basically have two planted, again, about three feet apart on center on those trunks. So I don't know that I put them in the same hole. That's pushing it because they're heavy. Citrus trees are all heavy feeders, even slow growing trees like kumquats, especially if you get good growth like we see here, um, you'll want to give them a little more space so they're not fighting for all that nutrition that they're going to need. But I'm sure you probably could get away with it, size-wise. So we have Lisa. Hubby and I are renting only a quarter acre till we find a place to buy, and we're not using it at not using it as an excuse not to do what I can. Uh, trees in potted plants. Mm -hmm. Good uh, Persimmon. Or no, I'm sorry, permission. Fresh to have chicks and garden, which I started late. Mm -hmm. I'm, the, I'm the one asking about shading my garden since I started a little uh, late. Okay, yeah. So basically anytime you have, so potted trees, potted trees definitely are, traditional potted trees will definitely need some shade, especially the first couple of years. Modeled sunlight is the key. So if you can get them underneath a shade tree, that's really kind of ideal. Watch the water because especially when we get into the peak of summer, even in modeled sun, you know, when we're 110, 115, and 30% humidity, that's really, really hard on potted plants. So they're going to need water at least once a day. You might need to watch them even more often than that. So yeah, shade on that for your temporary potted plants. And I'm just going to skip down real quick because Lisa, again, any advice for things temporary that will need to be moved? Yeah, keep them in pots. Uh, you, you might be able to get away with putting something in the ground, but I don't know that you'll get much of a benefit because you're going to wind up digging those up and it'll stunt the growth for that first growing season anyway. So I would say keep them in pots. That way you can move them fairly easily. And I think she's asking for um, any advice on like what types of things that, oh. that can take that will have to be moved. Right. So you can still do trees. We had pot, like we were saying earlier, we had 20 or so trees that we had potted that we brought from the old farm that we propagated ourselves. Those were underneath the mulberry tree mm -hmm. all of the last summer that we were there. So, and we kept them watered pretty much every day yeah. to make sure so they maintain pretty moisture. Pretty much any potted plant. Yeah, we, potted tree. we had mulberry trees, citrus trees, uh, fig trees, all fairly young, really, really young trees in five gallon pots for the most part. All right, we have Slam Boy feed or seed your bed with bait store worms. Yep, there you go. And it says, don't feed worms protein. And then uh, Darlene, happy Saturday. Happy Mother's Day, Lori. Thank mm -hmm. you. Happy Mother's Day Mother's Day to you too if you're a mother, everybody out there. Um, I don't think Slam Boy's a mother. Well, I know that. But all the, all the <laughs> or Daryl or any of the other guys. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So awesome. Have watched the AZ for Worm Farm videos. So Walmart, here I come. There you go. That's what I would do for sure. <laughs> all right. And take good care of them. So those worms are gold. Gardener's gold. That's what worm castings are. They're they're golden, man. Third and Homes, thank you. We have Chet on here. Hey, how's it going, Chet? Eileen and I send cold greetings from the extreme east coast. Woo! Cold? Yeah, east coast. Remember, I'm here all the time. I don't watch the news, so I have no idea what's going on out there unless you tell me or if I happen to hear it okay, so from somebody. I'll give you a quick wrap-up. Everything's in the yeah. you-know-whatter. As far as the world is concerned, we're coming out of COVID and everybody's excited about that. It's really cold in the Northeast. It's cold and rainy in the Northwest. Hopefully there's some rain down in the South because they need it really bad and we're in a drought. There you go. All right, I'm caught up. I'm good for six months. So. <laughs> All right, so Daniel, thanks. Oops, I don't know what I did. 
I think we're caught up there. Now I just have to find what yeah, I so did. Yeah, so just close here. Technical difficulties. There you go. Oh, thanks. Yep. That was going to give you an update. It must have heard you. <laughs> I guess. <laughs> All right. Where is the wine rack that was behind you? <laughs> yeah. So we moved the wine rack into our workout room. And the main reason, you can't see it from here, but we're in our office, which looks out over the front of the farm. And it, there's a lot of light. In fact, normally we have those shut, so I'm not sure if the lighting's weird. But uh, there's a lot of light that comes into this room, which we like. The problem with wine and light, bad combination. So the workout room is pretty much always dark. <laughs> so we have them in a darker spot. That's why they're not behind us now. But we did get a new couch. We got a live stream couch. So we were moving our love seat from the front room in here. <laughs> <laughs> yep. But now we have an official live stream couch, which is kind of a, still a blue, kind of a blue yeah. color. I this need is, to get some toss pillows, though. Yeah, we're going to get some snazzy toss pillows. Some snazzy? Bright, obnoxious ones. <laughs> All right, so we have Rob harvesting in May. Love living in Phoenix. Mm. Parents in Zone 5 haven't even planted yet. Oh, my goodness. And we're, like, at the end of our spring harvest for our garden beds, and we're into our summer harvest, basically, for all of our fruit trees. Mm -hmm. Yeesh. Oh, no. Yeah. Well, what's cool here is we were just talking about it with the consultation that was here this morning is how in Arizona you can pretty much plant something as far as fruit trees that you can harvest every month of the year. Right. So you're absolutely right. So one of the things that folks ask us is, you know, what are the different trees you can grow, fruits you can grow, you know, why do you grow so many? Our goal is to be harvesting from a tree or bush every single month out of the year. And the main way we're able to do that, and we will, we actually had that at, on the old property, and we're documenting it all, so we'll have that for you guys as far as the harvest calendar. But um, we, because we can grow citrus down here in the valley, if you guys that grow citrus, you know that basically you have limes ready to go in July-ish. You don't remove those from a tree until April. So it's kind of cheating, but not because we have citrus that you're basically harvesting all winter long. So where everybody else in the country, they harvest apples and then they're kind of done. Everything shuts down and goes to sleep. Our citrus season just starts kicking off, you know, once we get into November-ish. December, January, February, heavy, heavy production for all of our citrus trees. So, yeah, we'll be harvesting. We'll be picking a fruit off of a tree fresh every month of the year. All right, Jose, I planted a gala apple tree last year. And mm -hmm. this year bloomed and already has fruit. Yep, that's I'm awesome. I'm surprised it fruited since it does not have another pollinator. Right, so we've noticed that with the gala as well. You're seeing it as well. Now the gala is a very good pollinator though for the trees that are fall producing apples. Um, the gala and the Granny Smith are very, very common pollinators, cross pollinators for other varieties. So if you're going to be doing like a Fuji's, a Honeycrisp, uh, a lot of those other fall fruiting varieties, your gala is a really good pollinator. So, but yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, the, tr the trick with that and the key is getting those into the fall, which can be difficult for us here because there's some dieback in the summertime, but we'll keep our fingers crossed for you. Oh, and then also those are still sweet even in the middle of summer before they're red. So if you start seeing damage, harvest some of those bad boys. They're actually pretty good. All right. What would you say are the best edible plants and trees for Arizona and some time I get snow? And you get snow. So the best edible plants and trees and with snow. So your, your best bet is going to probably be either stone fruit or palm fruit. Both of those types of trees um, survive cold just fine. In fact, they need the chill hours in order to produce really well. So I would stick with those as far as fruit is concerned. Um, as far as edible plants, so like your typical veggies and stuff, if you get snow, you're going to be on a probably a spring through fall growing season. All your traditional crops will work there. And then during the wintertime, if it's not too cold, like, you know, zone four and down, uh, you should still be able to do your brassicas and things like that during the winter and they'll be just fine. Hopefully that answered your question. All right. And Chris, I'm about to go caddy shack on these ground squirrels. Oh my goodness. Tell me about it. So Chris, we know just how you feel. I know we were communicating earlier this week and your struggles with uh, the home and you guys kind of being in upheaval before the house is in. And you know, we, this is peak season for those little demons and they're everywhere. I mean, they're digging underneath all of our garden beds. They're digging holes all over the place. 
all the juveniles have basically come up out of the ground now that they're grown up and they're munching on everything. So I know how you feel, man. It's the reason why we have block beds with hardware cloth underneath and fully enclosed because we we're harvesting from our spring crops right now from our beds. The only reason we have them is because they're fully enclosed because all of those little buggers are digging down underneath there right now, trying to get into those beds. Mm -hmm. We see it everywhere. everywhere, but they can't get in. So let me know just how you feel, man. Uh, have you tried cherry trees in your area? Mm. Yes, we have. In fact, um, our Stark, was it uh, Stark Crimson or Crimson? I can't remember what it is. Either way, it didn't make Royal it. Royal Crimson. Yeah, so the Royal Crimson uh, that we bought this year did not make it, so it died. We tried two other varieties on the other property. Yeah, the Mini Royal and the Royal V, and those those still have not produced, and they've been in the ground for five years now and grow very slowly. We, I think we may give up on cherries. And we replaced one of those over there. We replaced one. one. never made it, and we had to replace it. Yeah. I, part of it's rootstocks. If we can get figure, if we can get a tree far enough along and get those over to reed so you can get them on a good rootstock, that might help. But, uh, yeah, the one we bought this year didn't make it. So... Yeah. yeah, we bought it bare root, but it came in and it was already leafed out a little bit, planted it, it and it didn't make it. No. So it's officially dead. So, so I'm not sure. Uh, cherries are a challenge anyway. Um, I, you know, that's kind of a trial variety from Zager. So I think it, it might work um, over a long period of time, but I think at this point we're at least going to pause on that and replace it with something we know is going to grow there. So. All right. Jay, just watched your radish harvest video. Nice. Mm. Just did mine as well. Wow. Nice. Were they hot? <laughs> Black Spanish and watermelon. Oh, wow. Ooh, watermelon. I've seen those. We haven't grown it yet. So, um, so now the black Spanish. So we have a black variety as well. It's a little spicy, but not super, super hot. Um, actually really good. I like it in salad. So yeah. it gives a little pop to the salad, but a black Spanish, that might be worth trying. Yeah. We fermented all those. We're going to show you guys that in the vlog tomorrow. But um, we fermented all those. We got, what, two half-gallon containers and three quart-sized containers um, right now going with uh, fermented radishes. And if you guys eat fermented foods at all, let me tell you, fermented radishes are fantastic because it loses... Well, so is zucchini, so okay, is garlic, yeah. so is carrots. Okay, yeah, fermented foods are pretty... We do a lot of pretty, fermented. Pretty cool. But radishes were surprisingly good. So, yeah. Well, I think it's because you don't like actual like radishes. Yes, that's true. Although some people get talked into eating them <laughs> by their sweetheart. Um, okay. Sam, hello from Santan Valley. Hey, how's it going in Santan? I'm sure it's warming up good. Oh yeah. We have David. Hey people, great to see you guys again. When are you going to cover Earth? With fig trees. <laughs> I love air layering them with a bit of foil. For sure. Um, going later, to Asgard. I'm going to Asgard. <laughs> uh, say hi to everybody in Asgard. Um, but yeah, no, I know fig trees. <clears throat> so we have the nine varieties of fig trees in the ground now. We have two, two that we know have made it. We lost the black Madeira, which is a real bummer. Um, but we have the other two we haven't put in the ground. We're probably going to need to pop those in bigger pots or something because... Till we figure out how to expand that. Yeah, because we're just tapped out on planting fruit trees right now. We do not want to put another tree in the ground. Not right now. We planted, what, probably pushing 300, over 300 fruit trees in the last four years. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's time for a break. All right, Slam Boy. When do we get a side-by-side -side of the old intro <laughs> next to current farm? My drone is on Waypoint, so I always get the same footage. Yeah, I probably should do the same. So we the right now, we're just getting out of the peak season. So we've got several consultations that are back-to-back -back in the month of May that we've been putting off for folks. So I think once we get into June, I'm going to try to take some extra days off. That drone footage, doing the mixing and everything else just takes some time. And I do want to get one. I don't know how I'm going to line those up yet, um, but I do want to get some type of time lapse going on. We also have plans to try to put a video together for you yeah. guys that Lori I'm going to try had. to do a video for a before and after of trees from when we planted them two years ago and then to current. Right. So I think that'll be good. Even like shots of the front of the property. I mean, two years ago, no, there was not, two and a half years ago, there was yeah. nothing here. Yeah. So... We're going we're gonna to try to put some of that together for you guys. We want to see it too, you know. 
Yeah, because it's amazing. We go out there and see stuff all the time, and we're like, okay, how, what size was this when we planted it? And right. Yeah. We know it as how it is now. Um, Eric, I've gotten so many blueberries this year. Are you going to give those a try soon? Happy Mother's Day weekend, Lori. Thank hey, you, Eric. Eric. Um, yeah, no, blueberries, probably not. At least not anytime soon. Just, you know, having, you're growing them here. Um, just keeping the acidic soil, you have to have them in pots. Um, you know, a specific soil mix. We tried them on our, on our city property, what, 10 years ago now? Yeah, we and, had some in pots. Yep, and we got a few blueberries off of there. Um, uh, but, but, uh, it was a lot of work to keep this, the soil acidic. We haven't done them since. So I don't know. I mean, Lori's going to have to figure out a way to have time. You would think after not working full time anymore that I would have time and I have no time. You have no time. No. So, um, so the biggest thing obviously is time. We got to figure out, we'd have to figure out a way to work that in. But congratulations. I mean, we love blueberries. Oh, so yeah. That would be fantastic. They go, those. it's pretty much one of our keys that we put in our smoothies every day. Yep. Yep. Um, Sam, have you had any problem with aphids or other unwanted pests? I have trees getting attacked. So we don't, we, we get aphids on the trees from time to time, although it's rare. Usually where I see those is early in the season when they're just breaking dormancy, if we get some rains, because they, they really kind of do need some moisture, um, is the only time we really see them. I, I generally don't see them though. Um, they Usually if the tree's a little bit older, it's not gonna be a problem. Usually what it is is ants that are harvesting the aphids, and it's why you see so many. You know, some soap water to take them off, but. Um, we generally don't even bother. So we kind of let them sort of run their course and the trees survive them just fine. So unless you're seeing damage on the trees, which we don't normally see damage from them because um, they pop up and then they're gone uh, once we dry up again. So we really don't have, have too many problems with aphids. Now, is that something I know um, Darren was telling us that Natalie bought 3,000 ladybugs. Was it for aphids? Yeah. Yep. There you go. She ordered some ladybugs in the mail. And we have, well, we have ladybugs all over the place in the back, in the farm. So that probably is part of an advantage for us. We have a lot of green around the farm between the weeds and the pasture, and there's ladybugs everywhere. Yeah. So I'm sure that definitely helps. Keep messing with your hair. I just thought it was funny that you can order ladybugs in the mail. You can. Yeah. I didn't know that. It's pretty cool. They told me. Yeah. Uh, let's see. We have Taylor. I really want to grow more food here in Arizona, but don't even know where to start. So I'm in Gold Canyon. Yeah. So I, so our son and his fiance live in an apartment in Surprise, and of course Austin's been here. He covered for us when we were in Florida a few weeks ago, and he kind of gets a, a little taste of the farm, and he didn't grow up that way. We were in the city when he was living with us. He was only with us for a year or two on the old farm. So, but he finally came to us a few months ago, wanted to start growing things. So they are growing tomatoes, cilantro, sunflowers. Uh, was it oregano? I can't I remember. So one of the one of those herbs, oregano, or they're they're all in thyme. pots, uh, like fourteen inch, sixteen inch pots on their patio. They've got a balcony. And that balcony, we kind of angled them so they got as much sun as they could. It basically only gets afternoon sun. And they have a couple of tomatoes on they there. They have tomatoes on there. They plants. do. Yep. So they're super excited about that. They bought it as a start. So what I would say is... Depending on your space. Depending like, you on know, space. Do you have a big yard? Are you in an apartment? Right. But I would definitely start with... Not right now. So don't plant anything right now. Um, it's too hard on the plants. But once we get into fall, so middle of September, October... Head over to Home Depot or Lowe's, get a pot, potting soil, and if you like tomatoes, grow a tomato plant um, or something similar, get a start. Put that into the pot. It's gonna need as much sunlight as it can get, especially once you get into, into October, um, and grow, that, grow something in a pot. That is probably the best way to do it, uh, and the easiest way with the least amount of cost and expense. But I would definitely start there. Once you grow something and you have it for the first time, your own fruit or veggie for the first time, You'll never go back and you'll figure out ways to plant. Yeah. So that would be my first suggestion. That or even like herbs or, mm -hmm. you know. That rosemary grows fantastic here. It's a very good culinary herb. I mean, people have it in their front yard and don't even realize it. Um, so you definitely could do that. You know, another thing too, we're, we're going into mesquite season. So you have your mesquite bean pods. I don't know whether or not you have a mesquite tree in your yard. Chances are good you probably, if you're here in Arizona, assuming you are, 
I think, did we say where we were? Uh, Gold Canyon. Perfect. So um, find uh, mesquite trees that have pods. Usually that's in June. Harvest those pods. You can grind those down into flour. We mixed that into like a, a basic um, Irish soda bread and it was incredible. Mm -hmm. So even if you're not growing them yourself, going out and harvesting uh, is, is a good way to do it too. So, but that's how I would start. What varieties of pear trees do you have in the farm? So we have three different types of pear. Well, I take that back. We have five. So we have two Asian pears. We have a Shinseki and a 20th century Asian pear. And then we have three varieties of, of like your common European pears. We have a Waddell, which is from Reed at RSI Growers. We have a Comus pear that we just planted that uh, doesn't have any fruit on it. And then the third one is a Seckle pear. And the Seckle pear actually has fruit on it. So the challenge with pears is the same as any other fall variety. The challenge is getting them through the summer because they set fruit now, they've, they've set fruit already, but they need to survive all the way through our summer into fall. So September or so before they're actually ripe on the tree, we haven't had one get that far yet. Uh, I think the 20th century pear was the closest one on the old farm. It wasn't quite ripe uh, when we were picking those. Can lychee trees grow in Phoenix? Mm. You know what? I know there's people that have lychee trees in Phoenix. Uh, we wouldn't try them out here. Definitely <laughs> way too cold here. Uh, but um, I know there's at least a couple people that I've seen on the Phoenix Fruit Growers Forum that are growing lychee. I just can't remember the production that they get off of those. It probably isn't a lot, but I, I don't know. So, Alan, wait... I'm still not seeing a puppy on the couch next to you. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, yeah, I know. So, Alan, so the biggest problem is I'm allergic to dogs. So, we wouldn't be able to have one in the house. Um, that being said, we have come to the conclusion that we are going to need to have a uh, livestock guardian. So, Lori's already been shopping. I think we've kind of settled on Pyrenees, the Great Pyrenees. Yeah. So, but it will be a livestock guardian dog. So, it'll be a working dog. So, we'll you, be outside. you might see a puppy in somebody's arms on one of these in the future maybe <laughs> but it wouldn't be mine it would have to be Lori's. <laughs> i'm still working on it yep yep all right lisa by the way what is a loquat what mm. does it taste like oh brandon so, thank you oh thank you brandon that's awesome dude <laughs> you're amazing too thank you that is really cool and cool pop-up what yeah. is that i don't know i know um what was the question i got totally sidetracked with a pop-up um, by the way, what is a loquat? Ah. What does it taste like? Right. So lo I've heard, we've literally had, we had a, a farm tour here. People were trying loquats. Everybody had a different description. My description is a mix of like a mandarin and a melon. So that's my description. Yeah. Maybe with a little bit of honey in some of the sweeter ones that are more ripe. Some that's people mine. said like mango and citrus. Yep. And, you know, so. Yep. I think, uh, Brandon, Greenies Garden Brandon, we talked to him what last week or week before. I know he was saying that I, I saw something he posted and he, he was saying it was like an apricot and a mango. So literally everybody's got a different description of loquats, but um, it's a, it's a fruit. I believe um, ori it's originally from uh, somewhere in Asia, China, someplace I like that. I have a couple in the fridge. You want me to go grab one? Oh yeah. Oh no. Well, yeah, of course. They're, they're overripe. So I was going to feed them to Rosie, but. Well, you just feed them to me instead. Oh boy. Now I, lo I lost Lori. This could really go downhill fast. But uh, the loquats, they have a kind of a firmer texture like a melon, um, especially when they're just ripe. And then, yeah, it's, <clears throat> it's similar to like a lychee. Somebody asked about a lychee. Um, similar texture to a lychee, almost a similar flavor to that as well. But a lot of those Asian kind of unique um, fruit is, is what they are like. So what's this one? This one's a gold nugget. So gold nugget. So it's a lot smaller than the other varieties that we have. And you can tell it's overripe, so it's really wrinkly. Mm-hmm. That's about, what, a third of the size of the Macbeth, the Yehuda, and the Champagne loquats. Yeah, so let me see if I can. And then there's seeds inside. There's anywhere from, we've seen, had as few as one seed up to, I think, five is what we had this year. So up to five seeds. Are you going to test it? Here. Go ahead. Okay. I don't, I don't want to be, sorry if I'm eating on camera, you guys, but. So now this is overripe. Mm. Way oh, that's right. really really sweet though. They have really big seeds. Mm -hmm. But and then the flesh is not very thick. Right, so it's a lot of pit. So the pits on the inside take up a lot of the space, 
Usually it's about a quarter of an inch of flesh on the inside. Uh, but yeah, the flavor is so hard to describe. Mm -hmm. And this one's actually almost has like a honey. It's overripe. So it almost has kind of a more honey type of flavor. And then yeah, for me, citrus and melon. Yeah, I think cantaloupe, like a texture of a cantaloupe and, and a cross between a melon and a citrusy flavor. Yeah, best way to describe it. Best way to describe it. Okay, sorry. And then I got my fingernails that are purple. Purple like, from harvesting mulberries. Mm -hmm. It's mulberry season. All right, so we have, how are the grapevines doing? The grapevines are doing good. So one of the challenges we're finding here is the we've had a lot of wind. If you guys are here, you know that um, it's been super, super windy the last several weeks. And these trees, because they're into their second year, we had to cut a lot of them way back, basically just to stumps. And they're putting off the new shoots. Well, those new shoots are not very strong and very stable yet because we didn't have anything on the three foot wire. So the challenge that we're faced with is these are breaking off. But I don't know if I've got footage for you guys in tomorrow's vlog, but the flames are already up to the six foot wire. The um, Cabernets are just about there. And the Zinfandels, I think, are up there. The Thompsons are also up to the six foot wire. So they're actually doing really good. I think we have maybe just a couple of the Syrah that are just kind of little nubs still. Yeah, I think they had a couple of vines that broke off and so mm -hmm. now it looks like it just started. Yep, yep. We can try to get it on next week's vlog. Yeah, we need to get you guys an update. About how long do you spend tending to the farm each day or ah, week? That's, it depends on the time of year. So you, you could probably answer that better than I can. You just, we just came out of peak season. Yeah, with peak season when I have, you know, pigs, broiler chickens, you know, everything. I literally am out there. I go out there as soon as the sun's up. So I've been out there. Now it's more like 5, but, you know, 5.30. Mm -hmm. And there's times that I come in to have lunch. And then I go back out for another couple hours to do afternoon chores. So you'll spend at least 7 or 8 hours a day mm -hmm. out there. Yeah, <laughs> summertime will slow down because we try to get out there when it's, you know, light at about 4 30 and then inside by like 9 10 but then we don't have the animals that we have to tend to in the afternoon yeah I, i'll tell Except you one for eggs right <clears throat> so one of the things i think we need we owe everybody we owe all of you guys is a real um a real hard look at how, how much time up with you and these gnats i don't know that's actually not a gnat that's a loquat <laughs> i'm saving some of that for later sweetheart <laughs> sorry so um, one of the things that we owe you guys is a real um, honest description and look at what a day looks like here, especially during the peak season for us, because it does take quite a bit of maintenance. Even though we have all these systems in place and automation, it's a lot. It's one of the reasons she's here full time and you truly are full time. I, I'm truly busy all day long, whether it's, you know, not always outside, there's sometimes inside where if I'm doing, you know, chicken stock canning, you know, mulberries right now and editing um, YouTube videos, editing, editing. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I still am working on even getting last month's live stream up on the website. I haven't finished that yet, but I mean, I, I don't take a shower until he comes home from work and we eat dinner and I'm like, okay, I'm going to go shower real quick because I don't stop. After we usually do a project in the evening outside <clears throat> after we eat dinner. Yeah. So it's, it, it definitely is a long day, but I think Lori would be the first one to tell you that she would rather be doing that than pretty much anything else. Yeah. And I know that there's going to be times where it's going to slow down, so it won't be that busy, you know, all the time. Right. And as soon as we get kind of some of these things that we want to get in place. Yeah. I think one of the things that every, there's a, there's kind of a, a normal season for farming. And when you talk to most farmers across the country, Typically what you're going to find is folks that are in the Midwest, central part of the country, maybe in the Northeast, Northwest, and they have a distinct season. And that season is basically spring. And for them, remember, that's not January like it is for us. So that's spring about now. So maybe April or so, sometimes March. And then they finish basically at Thanksgiving. And so, you know, especially integrative farmers that are, that are um, doing livestock, they kind of finish with their turkeys for Thanksgiving and then they shut down for a few months. So the challenge that we have here, because we have, we literally can grow year round, is we have to design that stopping time into our time. And the reality is it's still not stopping because if you guys are here growing fruit trees in Arizona, you know those trees are still growing and producing into June and July. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. And then oh, we, we have grapes and grapes are figs, in yeah. July. Figs can be into July and August. So the reality is we come back with our first round of broiler chicks by September 1st. So no matter what, we won't have much in the way of downtime. So no. just more so than what our peak season. Yeah. yeah. All right. So hello from Tucson, Serena. Uh, great to see you too. How are your kumquats doing? First year having them in my yard and followed your recommendation with Fukushu and Miwok. Kumquats. Fantastic. Great options. So actually they're doing really good. In fact, we had, they've only been in the ground now for what, two years. We had them all in pots prior to that. One of them we had to replace. One of the Nagami we had to replace. The new Nagami is doing good. They grow fairly slow, but now that they're in the ground, I've noticed that especially the Fukushu kumquat, huge. They were massive and they were amazing. Yeah. So the Miwa, it's definitely sweeter, but the pith, so the um, seeds and stuff on the inside, there's not a lot of space between those and the outside rind that you eat, you eat the whole thing. So the Fukushu, and you have that one, the Fukushus that we're getting now are the size of a small cutie basically. And let me tell you what, you eat the whole thing and they actually almost a similar sweetness to like an orange, mm -hmm. the last one that we had. And eating the whole thing, I was like shocked how good it was, right? Yeah, it was so, really good. It was really, really good. Good choices though. Sam, I had a burgundy plum that I have had in the ground for two years. It flowered the first time this year and had hundreds of flowers on it and the bees all over it, but I don't see any fruit. Yep. So in the ground for two years, very, very common. So we had uh, the old farm. We had a Santa Rosa that was, didn't fruit until year four, I believe. Uh, quick story, I grew up with Santa Rosa plums as a teenager in Southern California. I remember planting that tree with my dad. I was much younger. <clears throat> and I do remember that it took several years before we started getting a harvest. But then after that, we were getting hundreds of incredible plums on that tree at like year seven or eight. And then it, it was that way almost every single year for 20 years. So I think that one's just gonna be a matter of time. Now we did notice that with uh, the plum, the two Santa Rosas we have here, we have fruit on it this year, yet year two, um, but those were first time we've had reeds, uh, rootstock. Yeah. So that may be part of it. We'll, we have to stay tuned and we'll see how they do here uh, come on into summer. Yeah. All right, Slam Boy, um, jalapeno from store, put seeds in wet paper towel in baggie in a drawer, wait for sprouts and plant. Perfect. So I think plants Must be answering something. What to, yeah, what to plant, mm, like first jalapenos. thing to plant. That would be a good one. Yep. And they can overwinter. Do Asian pear trees suffer from Japanese beetles? Oh. We have a lot in have, Toronto here. Yeah, and we have a lot of Japanese beetles here as well. So um, I, I wouldn't say that they suffer from it, no. The um, Asian pears are, they have a pretty thick skin. So um, not really any any more issues than you would have with your figs and your peaches. I mean, we've seen those Japanese beetles inside. I mean, just munching on figs and peaches. So um, I don't know that you'd be able to get away, away from it, but we didn't have that. The Asian pears, they weren't, we didn't have a problem with them. Mm -mm. Hmm. I'm assuming it's because of the skin. Uh, okay. Question, best way to control leaf cutter bees in Arizona that have destroyed my peach, plum, apple, and other spring growth tree leaves. So, I mean, we get them too, and I gen we, it's generally not um, damaging to the tree. So the tree comes back, basically those are little half, they're little half moon, moon cutouts in the leaves is the best way to see it. You'll, you'll see them all yeah, over Yeah, we have them. We have them. We haven't had it to the point where it actually damaged a tree. So, I mean, the leaves look pretty ratty, um, but the trees bounce back and, and they're okay. We haven't lost a tree because of it. I mean, the problem is going to be, those are, I mean, those are common. So we've always had them, uh, but we, we, we just haven't lost a tree. So did you lose your trees or are you just seeing the damage on the leaves and you're worried about the trees? Because um, that, that, those are two different things. Yes, so, those have destroyed and they will. They'll go uh, after your stone fruit. Can you try any type of foliar like spray, like a fish emulsion or anything? If you were trying a like a, a cayenne uh, fish emulsion to try to deter it, but I mean, shy of um, actual mosquito netting, I don't know that you'd be able to keep them out any other way. But if you were trying foliar feed, that's a good suggestion. Cayenne. I just don't know whether or not it would affect them like it does yeah. mammals. You know, know, it affects, it helps out with squirrels and stuff, but I don't know whether it would, it would affect that or not. Yeah. I'm not sure. Uh, let's see. 
I'm on a quarter acre. I already have a raised flower bed with herbs, oh, okay. basil, thyme, and oregano nice. that grows year round. I really want to grow lettuce. Yes, so lettuce is definitely uh, fall through spring. So right now, lettuce will all be bolting. So, um, and that's most parts of the country, once you get into summer, middle of summer, unless you're way in the Northeast, for the most part, lettuce is really kind of spring, fall. For us, winter um, is the best time to grow lettuce. We grow lettuce in the fall. So we plant it usually in October or so, and then we're harvesting up until about March is what we do with our lettuce. But you definitely can. Easiest way to do lettuce is to get starts, honestly. Um, you can start them from seed. We've started them from seed directly in the bed. Um, it just takes a little while for them to kind of get kick-started. And quick tip on those, let them go to seed in the fall, in the spring. So we let them bolt and go to seed, drops those seeds. We actually have a lettuce plant. A purple lettuce. <laughs> well, we had, we had purple lettuce pop up. Oh, but we, we had a green lettuce over by the grapes. It's still there. Yeah. It hasn't gone to seed yet. So it blew outside of the garden and it's been growing up next to the um, next to the grapevines. Yeah. So. All right. Should Pakistan mulberry be producing right now? I have one second year in the ground and I'm not seeing anything at all yet. You're right. So you should have seen fruit set. Um, we only got a couple of ripe fruits off of ours this year. They're all a year and a half. So this is the second growing season for them as well. It's not uncommon for a mulberry tree to not produce the first couple of years. It's not uncommon, but typically for us here in Arizona, you'll at least see fruit set early. So you would have seen it about a month ago. Um, we were just looking at our black packs. We don't have any more fruit on there. Most of the fruit has blown off. So it's possible that you, unless you're looking at it every day and you're diligent, you may have actually had some on there and these crazy winds we've had have blown them off. Um, but it could just be that it's a little shy. Um, that does that does happen, although it is it is uncommon. All right, we have B G Mesa, Arizona, in the house. Hey, what's up, Mesa? Sam, I have Lisa. a citrus tree that I planted in March. It's not very big, but leaves are turning yellow and crispy. Any advice? Hmm, it's a citrus tree. Um, you didn't say what kind of citrus, but. It, really doesn't matter too much. You planted it in March, which is fine. If you're seeing yellowing of leaves, um, what's your irrigation schedule like? Because it almost sounds as though you might be overwatering. It's possible, especially with a newly planted tree. Um, so if you can follow up, hopefully we'll catch your other comment and answer that. But yellowing of leaves is usually a pretty good indicator that the roots are not getting the nutrition out of the soil um, and the nitrogen in order to green up and do their thing. So it could also be a lack of nitrogen, although it's a newly planted tree, it doesn't need very much. And it also doesn't need a whole lot of water. So it could be too much water, which is rare, but it, it does happen. And the crispy, that happens a lot with new growth on a tree and it gets really hot outside. Right, so if it's up against a wall or something like that. Well, and we've had some hot days this week. We have. So, and a newly planted tree that's got new growth on it, uh, you could have that. We've had that happen as well. All right, Dwayne, allergy shots are worth the unconditional love. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I'm trying to build up. So Rosie, I've been okay with Rosie, and she sheds pretty good. And I know when we first brought her home, I was sneezing, what, itchy eyes and stuff. I don't get that with her right now. So maybe I'm building up a tolerance. Maybe that puppy will wind up here one of these days. <laughs> maybe, maybe. It, it, it will wind up here. Just probably not inside. <laughs> okay, thank you for clarifying. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Oh, but a cute little puppy running through the house. That oh would, my you know, goodness. Yeah. Have you guys had any issues with a virus, mosaic virus on your mulberries? No. Um, I'm I'm not very... That sounds familiar, but I don't know enough about it to... To speak on it, so I, I don't know. Um, we haven't had any issues with uh, viruses though in any of our trees. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, a big part of tree health, and one of the reasons why, honestly, we don't have a lot of experience with uh, fungal diseases, bacterial diseases, and things like that on the trees. I'm a firm believer that if the tree is healthy and it's happy, that it's going to fight all these off on our own. It's kind of like us, you know, we have, and I'm not going to get into this too much because I'm a health nut, but. Um, you know, for us, we do everything that we can to, to build our immune systems so that when we have things come through town, we've had a big one come through town in the last couple of years. Um, but when we, when we get these things, 
the healthier we are, the better the body has the ability to fight it off. And you can get into all the different reasons as to why, but one of the things we don't do well here, especially as Americans, is talk about health and nutrition and being healthy and staying healthy. And so when things come through that are dangerous to us, a lot of us don't have a healthy, strong immune system in order to fight it off. So for us, you know, that's eating well, getting plenty of rest. I don't need to go into all the details, but those are the things that we do to stay healthy so that we can fight those off. You know, your plants, a lot of it's the same. You know, what are they eating? You know, we have a lot of mulch on the ground. We choose varieties that do well here. Um, now, mulberry trees don't come with rootstocks, but our other trees do. Is it a right rootstock? Is it getting plenty of airflow and sunlight? Trees need sunlight all day long. Fruit trees need sunlight all the time. And so that heavy pounding sunlight, a lot of times, a lot of research on viruses and bacteria, they don't generally do well in the sun. They really don't do well when it's dry, hot, and sunny. Here in Arizona, we are usually dry, hot, and sunny. So the health of the tree, making sure that it's well-fed, well-cared for, well-watered, that includes pruning, the health of the tree will really help to fight those things off. And we generally don't have problems with bacteria and fungal diseases. Typically what we're challenged with are mechanical things that break a tree down. Rabbits, uh, ground squirrels, birds. Um, we, somebody had talked a little bit about um, the leafcutter bees. We get those as well. So, um, you know, even leafcutter ants. So a lot of ours are mechanical problems that we have with our trees. And typically we don't see those issues with viruses and bacteria. In fact, we, we really just don't. So I don't have a good answer for you there. Um, health of the tree. Got to keep that tree healthy. All right. Um, surround kaolin clay, clay would probably help. I'm not sure. I'm not is. sure it was ref what would it. What oh, it was maybe that might be to uh, the for the six. leaf cutter bees. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, it is my understanding that tissue cultured Pakistan will not produce for the first two years. Oh, okay. Interesting. I did not know did that. Did not know that either. And I know ours were grafted, mm -hmm. uh, which I know is part of the reason why we're seeing fruit set so early. We've had mulberry trees take a couple years. Um, and also realize that when you're buying a mulberry tree from a nursery, those mulberries were probably not grown in Arizona. And so they had to become acclimatized first. So you have that first season where everything's out of whack. Um, the second season, it's still trying to figure out, it's spreading its roots out, it's doing its thing. So I, I agree, it may be, that may be the case. Uh, I don't know enough about it to say one way or another, but it's not uncommon. Once you get into year three or four, if you're still not seeing fruit, that could be an issue because that could be a non-fruiting mulberry. So. All right, so we have, hi, you wonderful farmers. We live in Benson and have learned oh, cool. so much from you. Thank Very you. Very cool. Awesome, Benson. Benson. That's down in, by Tombstone, right? Yeah, Tucson, that's right? heading to Tombstone. So we I went think down Benson there before. Tombstone. Yeah, yeah, we've been through oh, there. cool. I really like, it's beautiful down there. It's yeah. unique, so. Yeah. All right, it's like that gel planet in Riddick. <laughs> I don't, <laughs> I don't know what that is in regards to. I barely remember Riddick. That's a that's a movie that's been around for a while. I'm not sure. Must be talking to somebody. All right. So we have Michaela for the beetles and cutworms. We use it to protect from the plum. Okay. So go. that was that clay. Yep. All right. How much water should trees be getting this time of year? Uh, okay. It's hard to say for anybody. So I can just tell you what we're doing. So if you guys are growing your trees similar to what we do here. Uh, where you're watering away from the tree, you've got irrigation rings, you've got heavy mulch and all that great stuff that can help absorb the water. We have 60 gallons going on the trees once a week. The peak of summer, we're usually at about 90, that's nine zero gallons, once or twice a week. So it's quite a bit. But um, that is because these trees are still establishing and more importantly, we're building soil at the same time as watering the trees themselves. And the soil that we're growing into is not amended. And so what we're trying to do is to help have that water help flush some of the mineral content down because of how we water. And it'll help the roots break through that hard soil. And you can see what the trees look like from that. All right. 
So my Santa Rosa plum has roughly 10 to 15 fruits growing, heading into the second year. Very cool. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Daniel, we're seeing the exact same thing. So we probably have about the same, both mm -hmm. on the standard Santa Rosa and also on the weeping yeah. Santa Rosa. That's cool. Fingers crossed. We get some ripe fruit. That'd be cool, huh? How familiar are you with Cochise County, Arizona, and are you guys doing permaculture? Okay, so I am not super familiar with Cochise County. We live in Maricopa. We always have. I know a little bit about Yavapai because it's just north of us, and a little bit about Pima because it's just south of us. But uh, heading further further down, going into Cochise, I really don't know. And I'm not sure, do you mean as far as growing there, or do you mean as far as like regulations that um, you're going to be up against for homesteading? Um, if you can let me know. And then are you guys doing permaculture? Yes. So um, we, I I have not taken a PDC, so I'm not that far into the permaculture realm, but I have done some, I have studied it a bit. I listened to a few podcasts that are permaculture focused. Um, so we do several things here. You know, I believe strongly in the zones that are used in permaculture. If you look at our farm, if you were here looking at our farm and when you see it from up above in all of the intros to our videos, you'll notice that there's a whole lot of stuff that's nothing away from the house because we start with zone zero, which is not technically a zone, but our house is where we started when we got here. And we're basically just into zone two, three for the most part. Uh, and I would even say we're really kind of pushing zone three. We're really still kind of in zone one, zone two. Um, and then wood chip mulch, swales, the mini swales we put around the trees. Um, we'll be installing additional swales and earthworks on the back of the farm to help capture and hold water to help recharge our aquifer. Um, we have our um, discharge chutes that go underground and fill into heavy mulched areas to help hold water on the property. So a lot of those things, um, I'm a firm believer in, um, uh, in some of the, the basic principles, care for um, humans and, and men, men, men and women, uh, care for animals, and return of surplus. Those are kind of the three main primary goals of permaculture. I'm a firm believer in those. You take care of people first. You take care of animals right behind that. I mean, to me, they're, they're hand in hand. Um, and then return of surplus, which you'll see we do. We use manure um, as a um, fertilizer for our fruit trees. That's on purpose. So, And we also stack functions. So all of those permaculture principles we have in place here on the farm, and it's really guided us um, through the first couple of years of this journey, and we'll continue to do that um, as we move forward. Is it easy to pop propagate arc blackberries? Hmm. I had one stick in a 24 inch pot in January that is now four feet. I would like to make use of the cuttings. So I think they're generally pretty easy to propagate. So we've been we've been very successful propagating our Primark blackberries here. Um, we're see uh, the biggest thing is getting the rhizome, getting the roots out of the ground um, when you do propagate because they send runners out as long as the soil is healthy and they're able to, they'll send runners out. And if you can get a portion of the roots, the rhizome with the um, shoot that's coming up out of the ground, that's the key because it'll grow from those roots. And that's where we've seen where we've transplanted larger cuttings. The cutting may die back, but then a shoot comes up from the actual root itself. And we have found that they are pretty easy. Now, there are easier varieties to propagate. Like the triple crown is easier to propagate. Um, and then figs and mulberries are generally easier to propagate. Generally. <laughs> We've had our failures there too. Uh, but yeah, it's actually, it's actually not bad. It sounds like you're seeing the same. All right. There are several people in one of the groups who are fighting the same disease. This is that mm, mosaic. The mosaic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, it is only fed organic and they are in full sun. It is probably 15 feet high. It just started. Mm, I don't know. I don't have a good answer for you. I'm really not sure. All right, healthy soil, healthy trees, add organics, test soils, at least five plus organic matter. Yes. Yeah, it's back to, you to know. the mosaic. Yeah, and it sounds like they're still, you know, I'm really not too sure, is that Pam? Uh, this is Joe. Joe. Uh, but it's probably from that. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. The good news is several people are answering, which is fantastic. Thank you guys. If you guys have other ideas, we have not faced that. So I do not have a good answer for it. Yeah. I think he's just saying, or they're just saying, you know, 
healthy soil, healthy right. trees. Yeah. So make sure you're feeding them, you know, just like this cover. Yep. And also foliar feeding. You know, we, we did a little bit of foliar feeding for the first time last year because of the ground squirrels. And we did notice that we had some really good, strong growth that came back out of those mulberries. We had one mulberry tree. It's down to four leaves. Yeah. And it's one of our best looking mulberries out there right now. Yeah. It looks really good. Yep. Um, and we are going to do some more of that. We got some of that tea from Ivy Organics. Ivy Organics. Yep. So we're going to, we will be on, in fact, it's, it's getting time now. Something else for you to do in the downtime, sweetie. Fantastic. Oh, you're so excited. I know. Yeah. All right, Jack Russell Terriers and mm. the Rapid Issues. Yes, I know. We actually have had several people suggest a Jack Russell Terrier. What I would like is I would like a combination of a small dog like that that just go after all those little demons that are all over the property and then a bigger dog that it's its buddy that can protect him from the coyotes. That's a good combo. All right. Yeah. Man, we're going to have a lot of dogs. I know. So we've got working dogs. Know. We've got a Jack Russell Terrier for all the little mongrels. Hmm. I just wanted to say that I keep trying to remember to go to your page before hitting my Amazon orders. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. I appreciate uh, we got a lot of folks that, that do that. Um, when you remember, that's cool. You know, if not, don't sweat it. I mean, it's literally, it's pennies, but it does add up. I mean, we've had a couple months where, you know, it's a couple hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that helps the farm because that all yep. goes into the farm. Yep. All of that goes into the farm. So... What's your feedback on summer pruning on fruit trees that put a lot of growth? Right. So we we have pretty much abandoned summer pruning here in Arizona, mainly on our stone and palm fruit. And it's mainly stone fruit. We used to summer prune peaches, which is really the only one that needs summer pruning, if you're going to say the word need, because we don't we don't do it anymore and it, we're, we're just we're just fine. But it would be ideal to prune those in the summer because your your fruit set is on last year's growth, so it really is ideal. Um, the challenge that we had, we did that the first couple of years on the on the old property, and it stunted the tree's growth. So they we we die back a little bit in June, July. Those trees finish fruiting in the end of May, beginning of June. We were pruning in June, and that tree would literally put no growth on until September ish. And I didn't like that. They didn't look healthy. Um, there was some chlorosis in the leaves. You could tell they were struggling. Did you say what tree it was? It was the, uh, um, our peach trees. Yeah. I so, didn't know if you had said that. Yeah, peach trees. So we've pretty much abandoned that. Um, your other varieties, the only other one that you might consider summer pruning would be citrus. Um, just because there's there's fruit on it basically all year. But we only prune citrus as, as soon as we're done harvesting the last crop. We'll prune at that point. Unless we have damaged or broken branches. I'm going to try feeding it moringa and see if that helps. Well, I mean, moringa is a fantastic uh, green manure, um, so it definitely is not going to hurt. So, and the soil life is going to love you for putting those moringa leaves in there. Love you for it. All right, the Mrs. Marvel, yay! All that downtime. <laughs> mm -hmm. All your downtime, sweetie pie. I have so much of it. <laughs> I'm just excited when you're able to like just get normal stuff done on the farm and I come home and the only thing we need to do is a little project here or there or whatever and then we just kind of go into the night and then go yeah. to sleep nice and early. I had worm spray from the worm farm a few weeks ago on all of my trees and plants. Fantastic. Yep. So a full year, little bit of foliar feeding. We yep. all caught up? I think we're all caught Ooh, up. Very good. So back to our topic. So our topic was uh, what we're harvesting in May. So we started out, we were talking about what we're going to be harvesting in May. So, so far we finished our loquat harvest, right? Mm -hmm. Help me remember this. Finished our loquat harvest, which actually this morning, you saw that um, today. We are still in mulberry harvest, although the Shangri-La is slowing down pretty heavy. The Everbearing has been pushing out for a month now and still has a lot of fruit. Mm -hmm. So we'll be harvesting mulberries. Um, blackberries. Blackberries are picking up, yep. yep. So our Primark and our Colombian thornless um, those are both um, fruiting and coming into ripeness now uh, so we just started doing those and then we have peaches yes they're so close i know so we got some good sized peaches we did find that we messed up and missed a couple branches on the peach trees a as far thinning. as thinning yep so we have some small peaches too yep so we're getting thin enough we got a handful um, but uh, peaches will be the next big one this month and that's probably, that may be it. We'll have to see. Um, 
as far as is harvesting. Oh, yeah, I can't wait to bite into one of those peaches. Oh, I know they're. We so haven't crisp. had fresh peaches for a couple of years now because we haven't had them since the old property. Exactly. Yeah, we haven't oh. had a ripe peach since 2019, oh, if I'm not mistaken. So looking forward to maybe it. 2020. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So I think we okay. are we an hour in. We are. I we think have so. Chet, with all you do, I don't know why you need a home gym. <laughs> <laughs> well. <laughs> I, I'm the one that works what's out. What's kind of funny is that we have we have a room that we designated the the workout room, yep. and we our plans was to put a home gym in there, and we mm. still have not done that. No, yet. so we have right now we have a small brooder in there for the duckies that we are supposed to be in there. We have the wine rack in there, <laughs> and a mini uh, rebounder. We have a mini rebounder, and I have a mat that I do yoga on, yeah. and some <laughs> calisthenic kind of stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so maybe we haven't gone down that road completely. <laughs> All right, so we have Joe as an ex-commercial peach grower. If too much and too much growth, so, so it's, it's a balance. balance. Mm -hmm. Twelve inches is the least you should thrive for. Too much then shaded. Larger wood stunts the bud growth. Um, helps uh, to keep the zinc, zinc up. Less twins, less doubling. In the peaches, mm. yep, great notes, great notes. So, guys, we're we're an hour in, um, so I think we're gonna start wrapping it up here. So, just wanted to thank you guys for being here today. We talked about it in the beginning, but this is the Desert Farmer Podcast. Once Lori has time, she's our primary uh, editor when it comes to our podcast. We will have those up on our website, so that's edgeofnowherefarm.com. Uh, so you guys can check that out there. A condensed version of what we did here today with just all the details for everybody. Uh, but really glad you guys were here. You know, we talk about this all the time, but you know, the, the most valuable thing that we have here on the planet is time. And you guys choose to spend that with us, not just today, but you guys spend it with us all the time and watching the videos. And you guys know, we love interacting with you guys. We always answer those comments, but we don't take for granted the fact that you guys spend this time with us. It's very, very precious to us and we do appreciate it. So Thank you guys for being here with us today. Um, any last questions as we uh, go? We had Raina. Have a wonderful weekend and happy Mother's Day, Lori. So awesome. Thank you. And then can you guys start sending us an email to remind us about these? I am signed up, but sometimes forget. Oh, you know what? That's a good idea. Bye, That's gang. a fantastic See idea. You yes. Thank month. you, Pam. Great suggestion. We do need to do that for all of our email customers. Are you on our customer email list? List. Probably. I would assume so. Okay. So. Happy Mother's Day, Lori. See you next time. Thanks, Chet. Yeah, that's awesome. And Thank you, guys. Alan. Bye, gang. See you See next you Alan. month. Thanks, Alan. Bye, Pam. So, bye, Raina, if you're still there. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, guys. Bye, guys. See you next month. And she said yes.